<clears throat> okay. Uh, this is part two here of schizophrenia and psychotic disorders. Uh, we are in another room, a different room here, and uh, uh, we are now right next to my office. So uh, the other one was down, was down the way here, and now this one is uh, right next to uh, my office here, across the way. <clears throat> Again, I apologize for all of the moving around and stuff like that, but. Uh, that appears that uh, that's what it's like for the time being. So, all right, let's go ahead and jump into this here. Let me uh, check and see if all the levels are right and everything's good. All right. Um, so last lecture, we had talked about um, psychotic disorders and schizophrenia in particular. And I had mentioned that schizophrenia, it, you know, you have schizo, which is uh, split, and uh, phreneo, which is a, a kind of thinking word, a considering word, so uh, reasoning word, things like that. So it, it really means split mind or split thinking or split reasoning, right? And we talked a little bit about uh, some of the qualities and the characteristics of not only schizophrenia, which includes delusions, right, which are ideas uh, that are, uh, uh, that are, um, that uh, or either fanciful, right, they're impossible, um, downright impossible, or m highly unlikely, right? And we talked about the different delusions. We talked about hallucinations, right? And these are kind of odd experiences or uh, out of the way experiences that people have, right? And they have uh, auditory, tactile, and somatic, right? And then we talked a little bit about um, uh, the different types of schizophrenia. So we have schizophrenia, we have uh, schizotypal, we have schizophreniform, right? We have brief psychotic disorder, right? And then we have schizoaffective, right? And for each one of these criteria, right, with the, uh, I think with the exception of delusional disorder, right, they have to meet at least uh, the three criteria, that is, um, uh, 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 hallucinations, right? Um, disorganized behavior, as well as um, uh, um, uh, delusional disorder or some type of delusion, right? So they either have to have one of those three or a combination of the three or all three of them, right? To meet uh, uh, the criteria for schizophrenia and even schizophrenia and even schizoaffective. Remember, schizoaffective was essentially uh, a schizophrenia with a mood disorder, right? We have schizophreniform, which is kind of a combination of, uh, of, of, of schizophrenia. They don't quite meet the criteria for schizophrenia, right? But they, they, uh, they, they, they and, and they're able to function well, right, with it. As where schizophrenia, they're not able to function well with it, right? And then we have schizotypal, which is kind of a, a, a it is, it's associated with it, right? It's a, it's a schizotype, right? So we have odd eccentric behavior, difficulty uh, forming close relationships, right? And things of that nature. What's missing from schizophreniform is the disorganized, behave, the disorganized uh, behavior and things like that, right? And then, of course, we have delusional disorder. And then lastly, we ended, up, we ended the class talking about schizophrenia for the Christian, right? Uh, the word the dipsychos, right? Uh, the, two, the two mind, right? That uh, if one is convinced or unconvinced of something God has said, or if they live unaligned, uh, not in alignment with what God says, they are considered to be double-minded, right? They're kind of having their foot planted in both places. Well, now we're turning our attention to basically what you have been waiting for this whole time, right? You've, you probably will take this whole class and now drop it now, right? <laughs> How, ca can we recognize whether a person has schizophrenia or whether they are demon possessed, right? I remember when I was um, uh, uh, in my classes, and we had talked about this in class. As a matter of fact, this was a topic that was brought up 
um, as a, we kind of tossed it around for about a half an hour. Uh, whether or not uh, someone, you can tell if someone is schizophrenic or whether or not they are demon possessed, right? And we had concluded uh, at the time that we were studying this, again, I was in my master's program at the time, that the way that we can tell is, is if we give them medication and they're well, right? Well, that's a medicinal reason, right? But what if you're not, you don't have any access to medicine, right? What if you, have, you don't have any access to that, right? Um, and of course, we would, you know, toss around examples from the scriptures that we thought were associated with schizophrenia, one of them being Nebuchadnezzar, right? Um, that he lost his mind, right? His reason was taken from him, and he ended up uh, doing, you know, uh, crawling like an animal, right? Well, that's, that's definitely not schizophrenia from what we saw here um, um, uh, in the criteria. But I was never ever satisfied with the explanation of, well, you know, just give them medicine and it's okay. If God's word is true, um, and, if it, and if it assesses all things, <clears throat> and if it addresses all things, well, it should be able to address this no problem, right? And so um, I began to examine the scriptures, and uh, I, I saw that there was, a dis there, was, there was some very distinct things about demon possession, right? And there are very distinct things about schizophrenia. I am convinced that at the end of this, you will know exactly what both of them look like. Right? All right, so let's go ahead and take a look at, uh, let's start with the question. Again, how can we tell the difference between psychotic disorders and demonic possession? Do they look the same? Or are they different? Right? Well, let's take a look at the uh, symptoms and the criteria, right, for um, uh, uh, schizophrenia. And we can also include schizophreniform, schizotypal. We can also include all of those, uh, uh, schizoaffective, brief psychotic disorder. We can include those in there because they're associated with this, okay? Now, they don't, they, these are not, they're not the exact criteria as schizophrenia, but, but, they're, they're, they're aligned enough to where we can include them in this particular diagnosis. We're also going to look at uh, bipolar one as well, <clears throat> just for our honorable mention. So uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take these symptoms and criteria and we're going to compare them to the symptoms and criteria for demonic possession. That's the best way to do it. And the means by which we're gonna do it is the scriptures. Right? We can't go to the DSM-4 or the DSM-4 or the DSM-5 and look at the criteria for uh, demonic possession. You're not going to find it there, right? But, so we have to go to the source, right? To where demonic possession is talked about in the scriptures, okay? So here's the scriptures that uh, are concerning demonic possession. So we have Matthew chapter 8, verse 28. Um, Mark chapter 5 verses 1 to 20. Um, Matthew chapter, uh, or Luke chapter 9 verses 37 to 42. This account is also found in Matthew 17 verses 14 to 21 and Mark chapter 9. So these are the same accounts, okay? Matthew chapter 9 verses 34 or 32 to 34, okay? Matthew chapter 12 verses 22 to 24. Uh, this is also found in Mark chapter 30, or chapter 3, verses 20 to 27, and Luke chapter 11, verses 14 to 23. Again, these parentheses are the same account as Matthew. And Acts chapter 16, verses 16 to 18. Now, collectively, out of the entire text, this is it. This is all the accounts of demonic possession that we have of the scriptures. <clears throat> okay? We have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 accounts, right? <clears throat> With one of them being an axe, okay? Where do you find most of these demonic possessions concentrated? Where are they heavily concentrated? They're concentrated heavily in the Gospels. Okay? 
And I believe that there's a reason for that, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a second, um, or later on down the line, um, in this class, in this in this uh, particular uh, session. Uh, but most of them are in the Gospels. Only one of them is in Acts. Well, so let's go ahead and walk through each of these, with the exception of uh, these parentheses. We won't walk through those because it's the same account. But uh, let's go ahead and walk through each of these and see what we can find. Let's go to Matthew chapter 8, verse 28 to 34. Matthew chapter 8, verse 28 to 34. This is right after uh, Jesus heals the centurion, all right, and cleanses a leper. We'll start at uh, verse 28. This is when they go to the other side of the Gennesarenes. It says, when he came over to the other side into the country of the uh, Gadatherenes, uh, two men who were demon-possessed met him as they were coming out of the tombs. They were so extremely violent that no one could pass by that way. And they cried out, saying, what business do we have with each other, son of God? Have you come to torment us before the time? Now there was a herd of many swine feeding at a distance from them. The demons began to entreat them, saying, If you're going to cast us out, send us into the herd of swine. And he said to them, Go. And they came out and went to the swine, and the whole herd rushed down into the steep bank and into the sea and perished in the waters. The herdsmen ran away and went to the city and reported everything, including what had happened to the demoniacs. And behold, the whole city came out to meet Jesus, and when they saw him, they implored him to leave their region. So we see here in this particular context, Jesus going into the city of the Gadarenes, and two men who were demon-possessed, right, met him. And it describes them as being extremely violent, right, so that no one could pass that way, right? They, were, they must have been beating people up and running people out of the, out of the tombs, Right, And immediately, they come to him knowing who he is. Now, these are not the guys that are speaking. It is, it is the demons, the unclean spirits that are speaking th through these men. Right? So, what do we see here? Right? And obviously, he uh, tells them to cast them out. Right? Uh, uh, they, they are afraid that... Uh, uh, they're going to be tormented before the time, which is fascinating, fascinating language. And he tells them, uh, if you're going to cast us out, send us into those swine. And so uh, he tells them, go. go, go into the swine then, right? And they obey him. That tells you something right there about the nature of who, who Jesus is. So we have the criteria here. We see the first criteria in Matthew chapter 8, verse 28 and, and, uh, and following, is the fact that they are extremely violent. Okay? That means that, that you know, more than likely they're beating people up, uh, you know, they're, they're ripping off clothes, they're throwing things at people. I'm sure that they have, uh, you know, kind of crazy faces, right? Foaming at the mouth faces, but they are violent, extremely violent. So far, that doesn't match here, okay? It doesn't say that they're violent here, all right? Let's continue. Let's go into Matthew chapter 9, the chapter over. Matthew chapter 9, verses 32 to 34, okay? Um, this is, uh, again, another healing sign here by Christ. I'll start at verse 32. As they were going out, a mute, demon-possessed man was brought to him. That is Jesus. After the demon was cast out, the mute man spoke, and the crowds were amazed. And they were saying, nothing like this has ever been seen in Israel. But the Pharisees were saying, he cast out demons by the ruler of demons, right? 
So we see here that uh, Jesus, as they were going out, uh, a mute, demon-possessed man was brought to him. Okay? Was brought to Jesus. And it says, after the demon was cast out, the man began to speak. So it would appear that this demon that was in this man was holding this man's speech. He couldn't talk. He was mute. He couldn't speak. Perhaps he couldn't open his mouth. Or maybe if he opened, if he opened his mouth, nothing was coming out. Or maybe, it, you know, he, he was mute. Right? But after the demon was cast out, the mute man spoke. And then the crowds were amazed. And they were saying, nothing like this has ever happened has been seen in Israel. Okay? So here we have another symptom. Right? Another symptom here. So we have extreme violence and mutism. Well, there's disorganized speech. A person can talk here. They just don't uh, create their sentences well. Right? But here it would appear that one of the uh, symptoms of being demon-possessed is that you can't talk. <laughs> The, 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 uh, the words are held. The voice is held. Let's look at Matthew 12. Matthew chapter 12, verses 22 to 24. Let's read this and see what we can see. Again, this is similar to this this is similar to the same one that we read it says then a demon possessed man who was blind and mute was brought to Jesus and he healed him so that the mute man spoke and saw all the crowds were amazed and were saying this man cannot be the son of David can he but when the Pharisees heard this they said this man cast out demons by Beelzebul the ruler of demons Okay. So again, another demon-possessed man, very similar to the one that we just read, was brought to Jesus, who was blind and mute. Okay, so he couldn't see and couldn't talk. He was brought to Jesus, and Jesus healed him. That means he cast it out, the demon, so that the mute man spoke and saw. This is really interesting here, because not only with this guy... This guy uh, was possessed by unclean spirits, and he couldn't see, nor could he talk. His, his, his voice was held, and his eyes were held. And then because of this, because of the way that he is working with these individuals, the crowds were amazed and were saying, this man cannot be the son of David, can he? This is a very interesting statement that these, that these, uh, these crowds are making because um, they are beginning to start to inquire if this man is the Messiah. Is he the anointed one? Is he the one that's going to sit on David's throne and bring in the age, the kingdom, right? The kingdom for Israel. Is he going to unify us, right? This is a big deal. And again, when the Pharisees heard it, they said that this man cast out demons only by Beelzebul, the ruler of the demons, right? So here we have extreme violence, again, which is not here. We have mutism that is not here. And here we have blindness, right? The, as you can tell right now, we only have three of them on here. There's going to be many more after this. But we only have three on here. This doesn't match this list. Like, not by a long shot. Right? It doesn't match this list at all. Let's look at Luke chapter 9. So now we're in, uh, now we're out of Matthew and going into Luke, chapter nine. 
verses 37 to 42. We have another account here of a demon-possessed man. Let's, let's take a look at it. It says, On the next day, when they came down from the mountain, a large crowd met him. And the man from the crowd shouted, saying, Teacher, I beg you to look at my son, for he is my only boy. And a spirit seizes him. Okay? And he suddenly screams, and it throws him into a convulsion with foaming at the mouth. And only with difficulty does it leave him, mauling it, mauling him as it leaves. It's amazing. I begged your disciples to cast it out, and they could not. Right? Then Jesus answered, You unbelieving and perverse, perverted generation, how long shall I be with you and put up with you? Bring your son here. While he was still approaching, the demon slammed him into the ground and threw him into a convulsion. But Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit and healed the boy and gave him back to his father. And they were all amazed at the greatness of God. Okay? So, we see that this, this, this uh, woman comes from this, oh, I'm sorry, this man, I'm sorry, not a woman. This man comes from a large crowd, tells him, to, pleads with him that his boy is basically being seized, right, by an unclean spirit, right? And Jesus obviously uh, heals him, but afterwards he kind of laments like, man, you know, if only you guys were convinced, right? And he uh, brings his son, and uh, God heals his son, and then they go and they uh, are all amazed at the greatness of God. Let's take a look at the... Uh, uh, symptoms here that we see in this text. One, we see uh, screaming. It would appear that in this particular text, this unclean spirit that seizes this boy, that apprehends this boy, uh, he, he begins to express this by screaming profusely, loudly, shouting, right? Next, we have convulsions. He begins to start to convulse on the floor and writhe and do all these things, right? So we have extreme violence, we have mutism, we have blindness, we have screaming, we have convulsions. Does this look like any of this? It doesn't, huh? But let's continue here. We have convulsions. And we have foaming at the mouth. Let me go back here. Um, and of course, the foaming at the mouth is the result of the convulsions, right? And he slammed, right? Now, what's, what I find fascinating is, is that the way that the language is written here in this text. So let's take a look at it again. Because Luke writes, now, now remember, Luke is a doctor. Okay, he's, he's, he's a doctor. He's a practitioner. So he's, he's detailing this, right? Notice the way that he writes. He goes, on the next day when they came down from the mountain, a large crowd met him. And a man from the crowd shouted, saying, Teacher, I beg you to look at my son, for he's only my boy. A spirit seized him, and he suddenly screams, and it throws him into a convulsion. Not he was thrown into a convulsion, but it, that is, the spirit did this. It is the spirit that has apprehended this boy and has seized him and threw him into a convulsion. It threw him into a convulsion. So notice here, just with these two, okay, that this is passive. This is stuff that's done, um, this is stuff that is done to the person, right? Not from an external source. As in this, 
all of the all of the narratives that we've looked at so far is from an external influence that is influencing them, right? And it's causing all of this stuff. But from this position, this is coming from within. Okay? This is active external. This is passive internal. Right? And what I find interesting about the text, too, is that these individuals who are coming to him asking for healing, right? They know without a shadow of a doubt that it's an unclean spirit. There is no, uh, and they deliberated, and then they went to Jesus and asked Jesus what he what he thought, and then Jesus said, "Yep, that's a demon. I'm gonna, uh, you know, I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna heal him." That's not the language that's written here. What's written here is that they knew exactly what this was. Let me, let me say it, that to say this. If we are guessing if this is demonic or not, it's probably not. Because the culture that they lived in, they understood this well. And the reason why we don't understand it is because it doesn't happen all that much. It's not that often. Why, why should we expect to know that when it doesn't happen? It doesn't happen, period, right? Now, I'm not saying that it doesn't exist still. That's not the argument what I'm making. What I am making is, is we've, the culture, this culture, the reason why they're so certain is because it is, it's, it's prominent within the culture itself. That's why. That they've dealt with this often. Okay. That this is something that's not unusual for them. Not something that indeed worries them and concerns them, as the text says. But this isn't something like the, the text doesn't go and they were scratching their head, man, what could this be? You know, and then they go and talk to Jesus, right? Okay. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 5. I'm sorry, uh, Mark chapter 5. Let's go to Mark chapter 5. Verses 1 to 13. Let's start at verse 1. They came to the other side of the sea, into the country of the Gennesarenes. When he, got, when, they, when he got out of the boat, immediately a man from the tombs with an unclean spirit met him. And he had his dwelling among the tombs. Notice most of these unclean spirits like to dwell in cemeteries. It's kind of fascinating. And no one was able to bind him anymore, even with the chain. Because he had often been bound with shackles and chains. And the chains had been torn apart by him. And the shackles broken into pieces. And no one was strong enough to subdue him. Constantly, night and day, he was screaming among the tombs and in the mountains um, and gnashing himself with stones. Seeing Jesus from a distance, he ran up and bowed before him and shouting with a loud voice, he said, What business do we have with each other, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I implore you by God, do not torment me. For, I, for he had been saying to him, Come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And he was asking, what is your name? And he said to him, my name is Legion, for we are many. And he began to implore him, that is the, the unclean spirit imploring Jesus, earnestly not to send them out of the country. Now there was a large herd of swine feeding nearby on the mountain. The demons implored him, saying, send us into those swine that we may enter them. Jesus gave them permission. And coming out, the unclean spirits entered the swine, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the sea, about 2,000, and they were drowned in the sea. Lots of stuff going on here. Right? We see uh, that there is a, there is some, some, uh, some, not only some symptoms, but there's a duration of time. This was a constant thing. Night and day he was screaming among the tombs and in the mountains and gnashing himself with stones. He was scraping the skin off of his with some stones. Ugh. 
So we have uh, uh, foaming at the mouth. Oh, that was the last one, right? We have uh, uh, superhuman strength. We have screaming, obviously, right? And then we have uh, physical damage to the body, the, na the gnawing of the body, the scraping with rocks, right? Just could you imagine how that guy looked? I mean, he, he, I mean, he was in deep torment. Again, notice the symptom in comparison to the symptoms here and the criteria. It's very easy. We just took the symptoms of, of the DSM-5 and compared them to what we see here in the scriptures. And we are noticing some trends. We're notice uh, screaming has come up a couple of times. Uh, we have superhuman strength, right? That he was able to break shackles without, without destroying himself, right? He was able to break shackles and break bond, bounds off of him. We have convulsions. Some people were blind, experiencing extreme violence. This was the same with this gentleman here um, that, was, uh, that was in uh, Mark chapter 5 that uh, his dwelling was among tombs and no one was able to bind him anymore even with the chain, right? Um, they kind of put him out in the tombs and he was running around there. They couldn't go into there and, 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 and cut through the tombs because he was there. We see, uh, again, like I said, convulsions. It doesn't look anything like this. We don't have delusions. We don't have hallucinations. We don't have disorganized speech. We don't ha we're not grossly disorganized. There's no catatonic behavior. No negative symptoms here. As a matter of fact, there is volition in this. The volition is to basically, uh, uh, there's volition in the superhuman strength, the, the unbinding of the shackles, the physical damage to the body. The volition is not theirs. The volition is the spirit that's in him. Let's continue here. Acts 16, verses 16 to 18. Now, I think that this period of time is unique. It is one of a kind. Why? Well, for a couple reasons. One is, the, is, is all of these things are taking place. All of these accounts are being written. Right? Uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. All of these uh, accounts are being written. As a matter of fact, there's not even any. Matter of fact, what's interesting is, is there's no uh, uh, demoniac, um, unclean spirit narratives in John. There's none of them there. Now, that's interesting. They're in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, but not John. And the reason is, is because John has a particular focus. His focus is really talking about how Jesus is the the Messiah of the world. He's the Savior of the world, right? Whereas Matthew, Mark, and Luke are technically written to the Hebrews, to the Israelites, to the Jews, right? Tell, showing them that this is indeed the Messiah who is uh, 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 prophesied in the Old Testament. That's the purpose, okay? Now that doesn't mean that John doesn't bring up anything from the Jewish history. Of course, you know the first uh, half of the uh, of, of the text is, I believe, is written for the Jew uh, because he's talking to Nicodemus, because it talks about his interactions with the Jewish people, with the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and so on and so forth. It talks about you know believe Moses. Uh, if you don't believe Moses believes in the works that, 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 are, that are talked about in the Old Testament, right? So, so, so there is, a, there is a, a, a Jewish focus, a Hebraic focus in John, okay? But we also see that the, that the Greeks are mentioned coming to find Jesus. I mentioned that. Um, it mentions when he's talking to Nicodemus, for God so loved the world. Where in the other Gospels, it's talking about Jesus being the Messiah to Israel. That I only came for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. You won't find that message in John. Okay. 
So there are distinctives there uh, that are found even within the Gospels themselves. But the main point is, is to show that Jesus is indeed the, the, the anointed one, the one that is sent by God for the Jewish people, right? And because of that, one of the markers of the signs that one was to look for uh, in the Messiah was that he would have authority over demons and unclean spirits, right? That was one of the markers to show that this indeed was not just a mere person who came in the authority of God, but this is kind of a guy who's operating as if he's God himself. These demons are coming up to him, screaming at the top of their lungs, are you, are you going to torment us before the time? Right? Wait a minute, hold on, you're not supposed to do that. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? So, so I think that um, these particular, this particular time period that, that, the gospels are, that the Gospels were accounting for, remember these were written much later. Um, um, they, they weren't writing them down as they were happening. They're kind of recalling these events as, as, as they happened, right? They're away in their ministries at this time. But I think the reason why these accounts are set here is because this was such a this was a unique period of time. This is to underscore that Jesus was the Messiah. Let's take a look at Acts because Acts is after Jesus ascended, and this is basically how the apostles are laying down the foundations for the church throughout the entire world. Starts off with Peter and the apostles, and then in the last half, it starts off with Paul. Paul being called to the ministry of being an apostle by Jesus himself in the ministry by which he was he was conducting himself with the work that God had gave him to do. Well, we read in 16, verses 16 to 18, in, in Acts, that there is a, a young girl who has what's known as a spirit of divination. This, this spirit of divination is associated with what is known as the Oracle of Delphi. More than likely, this was a, uh, a, a person known as a Sambithi. Uh, a Sambithi was a, um, an oracle. Um, uh, sometimes they had their own mausoleums or their own buildings, right, in which they would sit and people would come and uh, divine wisdom from them. If you've watched some of the old or, or even some of the Greek movies, right? Some of the Greek mythological movies where they go and meet, you know, the woman and she's kind of doing all this stuff and, you know, it's, I'm not going to do that again. But, uh, but you know, she's kind of doing all these weird things, you know, and she, she's got like a, like a python around her, around her, uh, around her arm and stuff. And she's wearing all of these, all this flowery stuff. And she goes, I will, I will, I will, I will, uh, I will, uh, address the oracle or something like that, right? Some weird thing that would be kind of consistent with this. This is the Oracle of Delphi, okay? Sixteen, chapter sixteen, verses sixteen to eighteen. Um, this is in Philippi. Okay, uh, let's go ahead and take a look at this. I'll start at verse fourteen, actually. It says, a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple fabric, fabrics, a worshiper of God, was listening. And the Lord opened her heart to respond to the things spoken by Paul. And when she and her household had been baptized, she urged us, saying, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. Verse 16. It happened as that they were going to the place of prayer, a slave girl having a spirit of divination. Again, this is, again, uh, connected with the Oracle of Delphi. Actually, the Greek word there is pythanos. Uh, this is where we get the word python from. Okay, so this was a, a, a girl from the Oracle of Delphi um, that they had taken captive and were using her for profit. It says, uh, having a spirit of divination met us who was bringing her masters much profit by fortune telling. Following after Paul and us, she kept crying out, saying these men are these men are bond servants of the most high god who are proclaiming to you the way of salvation she continued doing this for many days now it's hard to tell whether or not this this pathanos is is speaking this from a, a demonic place 
or because she's hearing them proclaim the message of God, she they're kind of use she's kind of using this for her own personal gain. I think this I think this I think the latter is true rather than the former. Okay. In other words, she's following them because wherever they're going, they're drawing a crowd, right? Because they're preaching and proclaiming. And so she's kind of using the message to kind of, uh, uh, you know, gather people away from the disciples and, and, and basically focus on her. And this is all for profit, okay? It's kind of the idea here because she follows them for many days. She continued doing this for many days, but Paul was greatly annoyed and turned and said to the spirit, not the woman, not the, not the young girl, not the, bee, not the woman, to the spirit. I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very moment. And verse 19, this is why I think that they were they were kind of hijacking the message. They were kind of following Paul and them and hearing the message that they were proclaiming. And she was kind of hijacking this and kind of using this as if, you know, she has some great power of fortune telling. But that wasn't what was going on here. But when the master saw that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the authorities. Right. So again. Uh, we see another criteria here, another symptom, I'm sorry, another symptom. The symptom is, is crying out, which is what we saw too uh, in some other accounts, right? That they come before the, uh, the Son of God and they cry out to him, right? So it would appear that a person who is possessed by uh, demonic spirits or unclean spirits, the criteria would be they would have to have at least two of these, right? Either extreme violence and superhuman strength, as we saw in the accounts, either mutism and blindness, either mutism, blindness, screaming, um, convulsions and foaming at the mouth and screaming, um, crying out and foaming at the mouth and convulsions. It would appear that you have to have at least, there's, there's one where it's just one of them, right? Where a person is mute, right? But it would appear, on average, you need at least two. And again, if you notice that this is very different from this. First of all, this is five. This is nine, right? There's delusions, but there's no delusions here. There are hallucinations in schizophrenia. There are no hallucinations here, right? That means hearing voices, too. There's no account in the text that we can we can come up with, and, and again, we've looked at all of the instances. I didn't look at the ones in parentheses because those are the same, those are the same accounts. But in all the accounts, it never says that the that the the uh, people who were possessed by spirits heard voices. It doesn't say that. As a matter of fact, we can, we can say for certain that the demonic possession is the hijacking of one's body to do what it wants, right? There's even one account, I didn't put it in here, um, I think it's one of the ones uh, that uh, there's more information for, the ones in parentheses, because some of them add a little bit more information, uh, where one was uh, thrown into the fire by one, okay? The spirit threw them into the fire. It's not like they they were playing with fire. It's not that they were they had pyromania. They were they were being thrown into the fire for the purpose of them being destroyed. All right. That's not in this. We have disorganized speech that is uh, uh, formalized thought. Right. We talked about that last last hour. That's not here. As a matter of fact, it would appear that they can they can string out words together to make sense son of god have you come to torment me before the time right don't cast us into those cast us into those pigs right there is coherent speech coherent thought there's consistency of ideas right there's no disorganized speech over here you can understand them just fine there's grossly disorganized or catatonic behavior. That's not over here. There may be behavior that's extreme, but it's not like this. 
and negative symptoms, diminished emotional expression or abolition. You don't find any of that here. It's not like they're just sitting there staring off into space. That's not demonic possession, not what we read and what's recorded in the scriptures. These demons are very active in the person that they inhabit. So much so to where they try to destroy themselves, or not themselves, but destroy uh, uh, the host that they're in and others in the process. Again, this is, a, this is very clear, right? From, it's very clear. Now you know why, right? Now you know why I said that, that you'll be able to look at this and if someone says, well, they might be demon possessed, you'll go, no, not even close. Not even close. I mean, you're like way off. So let's look at the differences between the two diagnoses. Schizophrenia is caused by an imbalance of neurotransmitters. Neurotransmitters in the brain. We know this because we know the research. This is consistent with studying um, uh, uh, natural revelation, right? And we know that we live in a world that is that that where things don't work well, right? Schizophrenia is caused by an imbalance of neurotransmitters. This is why people hear voices. It's not because there's a there's a demon behind them. Psst, hey, over here. No, it's because there's something going on in the brain, probably uh, possibly within uh, the temporal lobe, right? There's an imbalance of neurotransmitters in the temporal lobe that is causing them to hear these things. and other things. Demonic possession is caused by unclean spirits. And again, may I add that these individuals who are in the scriptures, they weren't scratching their head or sitting down deliberating what these symptoms meant. They knew exactly what they meant. As a matter of fact, go back to Oh my gosh, I think it's in Matthew. Uh, Matthew. Uh, Matthew 11. Uh, let's see, Matthew. Well, that's not it. Uh, hold on for just a second. Ah, uh, let's. Let's look, let's look at uh, Matthew, Matthew chapter 17. Matthew chapter 17. Let's go back to that and look at verse 14 and following. Okay? I want us to read this, I want us to read this text and ask ourselves whether or not that the person who is, who has this uh, boy who's a demoniac, if he's deliberating it off, he's thinking about, well, maybe this isn't what it is. Uh, when... I'll start at verse 14. When they came to the crowd, a man came up to Jesus, falling on his knees before him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is a lunatic and very ill and often falls into fire and often into water. Okay? I brought him to your disciples and they could not cure him. Again, this is an associated passage from the one that we just looked at before. Right? So he's, he's a lunatic. Well, that, that, that's a different word there than lunatic. And he's very ill, for he often falls into fire and often into water. Why? Because he's the spirit is causing him to throw him into fire and into water. Okay. And then, uh, and then, um, uh, the reason why the disciples couldn't uh, couldn't drive him out is because they were unconvinced. Okay. They were unconvinced that they that they that they could. He sent them out to do this, and they didn't think they could do this. Right? So schizophrenia is caused by an imbalance of neurotransmitters. Demonic possession is caused by unclean spirits. Okay. Again, this is one of the reasons why he had brought them to Jesus, because he could help them. I mean, I mean, he didn't take them down to the local pharmacy to get them something, uh, to give them some medicine. That, that, that's not stated in the text, right? He knew that this was something a little different. Schizophrenia has a lack of coherence in speech, whereas demonic possession, when they speak, they are coherent and understandable. We saw that, right? 
As a matter of fact, if you go back to uh, Matthew chapter 12, I'm sorry, not Matthew chapter 12. Uh, let's let's go to uh, uh, let's go to uh, Acts 16. I'm sorry, Acts chapter 16. We go back to Acts 16. Verse 16, we see that, that the uh, Pathanos, the, uh, the oracle of Delphi, speaks. These men are bondservants of the Most High God who are proclaiming to you the way of salvation. Right? That's, that, that's the idea. Right? She is coherent. She's understandable. Right? And yet she's demon-possessed. Schizophrenics don't ha have, to have a problem with being coherent in speech. Schizophrenia has with it the presence of negative symptoms, that is, lack of affect, abolition, things like that, whereas demonic possession does not. Very simple. And schizophrenia had, carries with it hallucinations and delusions of all kinds. Demonic possessions do not have the quality of hallucinations nor delusions. Okay? Again, the contrast could not be clearer. Okay? It couldn't be clearer. Schizophrenia includes delusions. Demonic possessions does not include delusions. Okay? It doesn't include uh, 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 concepts of reference or, or aromatic delusions or, 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 um, or uh, uh, you know, other delusions that are mentioned. Schizophrenia has to, do, has to have a certain criteria over the duration of time. Demonic possessions do not have a criteria or a duration of time. They don't have a duration of time. When you're possessed, you are possessed, you know. This one, uh, this one has a certain duration of time because we, we, we want to make sure that the person has been dealing with it for, for a while, not because we want them to suffer, but because we want to make sure that they have the right, the right tr diagnosis so we can get the right treatment, right? We don't have to do that if a per person is demon-possessed. By the way, I've never met a person who was demon-possessed because I've never seen those qualities. Schizophrenia does not carry with it blindness, but demonic, but demonic possession does, uh, does have it. It does, not, it does have it. Schizophrenia carries with it superhuman strength, uh, does not carry with it superhuman strength, and the demonic possession does. We should flip those. <laughs> I have to make sure I correct that. So what about bipolar one? I've often heard this too. Well, how do you know bipolar one is a demonic possession? I actually had somebody ask me that, right? I was like, well, let's take a look, right? Let's take a look at the, uh, at, at, at the criteria for, uh, uh, for demonic possession, and let's take a look at the criteria for bipolar one. Uh, so inflated self-esteem or grandiosity? Uh, that's not there. Decreased need for sleep? Um, well, that might be an effect of one of these, but it's not listed here. It doesn't say that you know uh, they were they were out in the tombs and they didn't sleep for eight days. That's the, that's 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 not what it says. Okay. More talkative than usual, or the pressure to keep talking, uh, that's not here. Flights of ideas or subjective experiences that thoughts are racing, that has to do with someone else. Right? That has to no. That has to do with the person who's experiencing this. This has to do with them being affected externally. And distractibility, attention too easily drawn to unimportant and irrelevant, and irrelevant stimuli, that is not found here on this list. Could not the contrast be more clear? So how do we know demonic possession and how do we know that demonic possession is not found, and how, how do we know that schizophrenia is not demonic possession? Well, it's rather quite simple. The criteria for schizophrenia is not the criteria for demonic possession. It's not even close. And I would say that really we'd be hard pressed to find demonic possession today. I'm not saying that it doesn't happen. I'm just saying that it's not common. 
It's not, it's not, it's not common. Because really, this is the period of time where the foundation of the church is laid. And really, in reality, it's the underscore of the fact that Christ is the Messiah. Okay? Again, I'm not saying that it doesn't exist. Or that, you know, it's, it, you know, that, I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying that, that, that from what we've observed, according to the text, in relation to the DSM-5, concerning bipolar 1 and schizophrenia, it's not there. And we can also include cyclothymia. Um, I'm sorry, wrong one. But we can include that there too. Um, we can also include schizoaffective. We can include uh, a brief psychotic disorder. We can include schizophreniform, and we can include schizotypal and delusional disorder. All of the psychotic disorders are not found in demonic possession and vice versa. None of them are. Schizophrenia has to do with imbalance of neurotransmitters and possibly uh, 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 some some uh, social interaction, lack of social interaction, and and, and things like that. Okay. Of course, both of them inhibit social and occupational functioning. That's probably the only thing that joins these together. <laughs> you can't, you know, you if you go to work with this, uh, you, you're definitely getting sent home for sure. Um, you probably won't be able to hold relationships with best friends or anything else like that. That's the only commonality that they have between the two. But other than that, that's where it ends. Right? Some things to notice. Demonic possession appears in the Gospel and Acts, but none explicitly in the epistles of the New Testament. Um, this is exactly why I think that this is a unique time period. Because we're not dealing with, with, with most of the things that these cultures over in the East deal with. We're not dealing with stuff like this. When we see a person who's wild-eyed and stuff like that who kind of looks weird, they're not even demonically possessed. Because it doesn't state that in the text. Right? They may have a psychotic disorder. I, that might be true. Right? But this is a unique time in history. Church possession was taken care of or removed by Christ and the apostles. We don't see a lot of individuals who, who are not apostles removing demons. We don't see that. It's mostly Jesus and those who were called to be apostles, right? We see Paul doing this, right? As a matter of fact, one of them try to do it and they say I, re I know Jesus and I recognize Paul but who are you <laughs> you know what I'm saying uh, we see the apostles having this particular authority to do this and even Jesus I don't even think us as believers have this authority or this ability to I don't think we do because there's no text in the scriptures that say that we do it's none of it there Kind of fascinating. Demonic possession is caused by an external influence that expresses itself externally. So it's an external influence. It's outside of the person, right? Where schizophrenia is caused by an internal influence. That is the, 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 the brain and how it works that expresses itself externally. Right? It has to do with perception. It has to do with thought, cognition, speech, language, behavior. It is passive, not active, right? Here's something to think about here. All of the psychotic disorders that we have examined are a result of the passive effects of the fall and does not fit into the category of active acts of sin. If we are to diagnose people from the perspective of the biblical worldview, we are to conclude, based upon what we've examined from the text, from the scriptures itself, as well as from the criteria of each of these disorders, we have to conclude that these behaviors 
are due to the passive effects of the fall. This is being done to them. This is very important because we have individuals who are teaching that this is demonic possession. Much of the, much to their ignorance. Okay? That's not true. And they're, and they're telling uh, people who have the psychosis, who can't even think straight, essentially, who don't have a clear mind to basically repent of things that they didn't do. Or praying for them that God, that God would exorcise the demon out of them. Or, that, or, or we have biblical counselors who essentially don't know how to argue this biblically. And so they end up either becoming unsure or trusting in research. Well, what if I give you a pill that's supposed to help for your schizophrenia and it doesn't work? It could be that I just gave you the wrong pill, right? Or I didn't give you more of a high dosage of it. Or if maybe they're acting like this because they're rejecting life. There's some idol they need to break. This, is, this has been damaging to the body of Christ because we find that there are people who have real diagnoses, real trouble, and in an attempt with the best intentions and the worst of results, they try to pigeonhole uh, sanctif justification or sanctification as if, as if that's the problem. And that's not the problem. Because they're not considering. They're closing themselves off from uh, observable data that, that, that natural revelation gives us. We would put this in the passive category. And I, and I, would, and I would argue, I challenge anyone who wants to argue that point, that this is not some sort of spiritual problem. This is a physical problem because we live in a world that is fallen. That's why. So as you can see, we have here, we have bipolar 1, bipolar 2, and cyclothymia. We have schizophrenia and all other psychotic disorders here in the passive effects of the curse of sin. If you notice, I want to I take a few minutes and talk about this here. Do you notice that most, that's, that most of the disorders that we've looked at so far are all in this category. And there's a reason for that. Not only are all these things in the category have to deal with either perception or, or, or the perception of how one sees, which is not a sin, by the way, or it has to do with uh, the body and how the body responds, right? How the body works, right? The reason why there's not really any over here say one, right, is because the active acts of the sin nature are already made clear in Scripture. That's why. They're already made clear. Now there is a disorder that goes over here. And the only reason uh, major depressive disorder is over here is because we're talking about the effect, right? that someone can have major depressive disorder because they are acting in a way that's either not aligned with their, uh, with their identity or they are, they are, you know, they're not saved, right? And so they're acting out of that nature. But, but the reason why we don't really have that many over here is because Scripture's clear on those, right? And we even have some that don't have to do with either one of them. Right? Again, it's not that difficult. I, again, the, the Bible speaks to everything. Everything. We just have to know how to observe the data. That's all.
And we know that schizophrenia, like mania, like bipolar 1, bipolar 2, is real. We don't have to argue with that. It is real. Why? Because it is seen and observed in natural revelation, post-fall. We know this. We need to have wisdom. And if we don't have it, we need to get it. It upsets me so much that us as counselors close ourselves off from information that could help us serve our counselees. I'm not the best counselor in the world. I'm not. I know some that, that will blow my socks off any day of the week. I'm not the best counselor in the world. But I do know this. I do know that when I counsel, I don't assume that people are... Are, are dealing with some sin issue. I don't put everything over in the act of sin category when I work with them. I understand enough to know that a person who's dealing with something, we might have to dig a little deeper and see whether or not it is something that they're dealing that is an act of sin issue or if it's not and how to deal with it accordingly. There's so much to learn out there. All right. Well, I hope that this was enlightening for you. I, it was enlightening for me learning this a long time ago. And I'm, I'm privileged at the fact that I get to teach this and train others to have this eye. We need to be good biblical clinicians. Biblical clinicians to observe things as they are. And the scriptures does speak on this. I, it's, it's unfortunate that even some Christian counselors, because of the fact that they, Christianity, uh, I'm sorry, biblical counseling has gotten such a bad taste in Christian counselors' mouths, that whenever we bring up the fact that we use the scriptures, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a reactionary response to that. It shouldn't be like that. Both sides need to be wise in how they observe the text and how the text applies to things like this. It is possible to do because God has created reality, as we've mentioned several times before. And he's given us the answers to observe these things and how they work. All right, well, let's go ahead and pray. And uh, I'll get off my soapbox and we'll pray. And then uh, um, I'll stop the video if you haven't stopped it already. Lord, thank you so much for your grace. Thank you for your word. You are showing us, you're demonstrating to us that your word is indeed what we should be going to, to understanding life under the sun, under heaven. It's that clear that you don't want us to doubt our lives at all, at all, that when we doubt our lives, we aren't looking in the place that we need to look. Thank you so much, Lord, for your word, for the scriptures. I pray, God, that you would protect us as we go about our separate places. And if it is your will, that we would meet again next week and continue to talk about uh, abnormal behavior, how it affects our lives, and what we as counselors who uh, hold to the biblical worldview can do to help and serve individuals in this regard. We love you so much, Lord. It's in your son's name. Amen. Amen. Well, grace and peace to you, and uh, I will see you next week. Okay, take care.